I've got no Twitter, no Instagram, no Facebook, no nothing. And it's not just like deactivation. No, the accounts are gone. Mm. Um, and, uh, and in hindsight, it's one of the best decisions I've ever made. Welcome to The Carla Rand Show, a weekly podcast designed to dig into the lives of everyday people. People who are making a positive impact. People who have risen above and overcome obstacles. Insights and stories from ordinary individuals who inspire us all towards the truly extraordinary. Here's your host. Hey, it's Carla, and I have this guest on. His name is Dan Garner. He is an expert nutritionist, and he is someone that I've looked up to for, I was trying to think how many years, at least three years. He is um, a fitness coach, and he coaches celebrities. He coaches elite athletes, so he knows his stuff. He's an absolute genius as far as, like, he studies all the time. He's an author. He's a podcaster. He is a speaker. He speaks all over the world, and it was just such an honor to have him on my podcast podcast really really made me feel special and the way that he was able to just share stuff and I just picked his brain about fitness I picked his brain about nutrition he also has four businesses so I did pick his brain a little bit about entrepreneurship and like running a business and that kind of stuff we got into that a little bit about like what a leader looks like and it might have been one of the favorite things that he said on this podcast and he said that you know being being successful is more about it's not so much about strategies and tactics but it's about character and that's really the kind of guy that Dan Garner is so I know you're gonna love this episode and I'm just really excited to share it with you well Dan Garner welcome to the Carla Rancho I'm so glad you're here thanks for being here yeah no problem at all thank you for having me Carla yeah, and Dan, I want to say, like, I have followed you and I have, like, been looking up to you for the last two or three years. So to have you on is a real treat. It's a real honor. I've been listening to your podcast. I took your nutrition mentorship and I was looking through all your stuff, Dan, and I was like, I don't even know how to introduce you because you've done so much. Like, I could spend a half an hour just talking about all the things <laughs> you've done. But I'll just yeah. say a few yeah. things. So. You, you know, you're a speaker and you've traveled around the world speaking mainly about nutrition, but also about fitness. Yep. You're a nutrition expert. Um, you've written for journals. You have a podcast. You are a coach as well. So you do high level coaching with um, some celebrity athletes and stuff as well. Correct? Yes. yes. Yeah. And the cool yes. thing is that you do lab testing too. And that's something that like I would love to get into because a lot of my nutrition clients, they like I can help them only so far, but a lot of times I just tell them, well, see if you can get some lab work from your doctor or something, right? Mm -hmm. But it's a yeah. little bit tricky. So I know you can do lab work. And so I've actually referred some people to you, Dan. I don't know if they ever looked you up or not, but I referred some of my clients to you because they were having some, some, you know, more issues that I just felt like I couldn't deal with. So I was sending them your way. Um, but yeah, so I really look up to you and I was, I just feel super honored to have you. So, yeah. so thank you. But I don't know a whole lot about you, Dan, like about your childhood and stuff. And obviously our listeners aren't going to as either. So why don't you just go back? Let's go back. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Where did you grow up? What were you like as a kid? That kind of stuff. Sure. Yeah. Well, thank you. I'm ex super excited to, to be here. And thank you so much for all your support over the years. Um, yeah. It's funny when people throw clients my way, that's normally the case. It's like, I don't know what's going on, but there's this crazy bald guy in Canada and he <laughs> does labs and sometimes he can figure it out. <laughs> and I'm like, all right, awesome. I'll, uh, I'll work with this thing. But yeah, thanks so much. I'm excited to be here. And growing up, um, I mean, I got into fitness way back in the day, probably at about 14 years old. I remember my dad bought me at a garage sale, one of the old school um, plastic weightlifting sets that are filled with concrete, the old school York ones that oh, yeah, a yeah. lot of us start out with. Yeah. So I trained with that thing in the garage, which had no insulation, heating or AC. So absolutely boiling in the summer, but absolutely freezing in the in the winter. But um, it, I loved every single second of it. And the getting into health and fitness for me, it originally started because of my my involvement in martial arts. I've been in martial arts my whole life, and I was quite a, a quite a good fighter. I was traveling around Canada doing that type of a thing, and I wanted to get better at it. It's like the first time I wanted to really bring discipline into my life, work on my nutrition, work on my training, and just become a better fighter in that respect. And then when I got into training and nutrition, the thing that I loved the most about it was the in Input output relationship of both martial arts and in training and nutrition, in that you get what you put into it. I always loved that. If I show up 
four or five days a week to class, I'm going to slowly go up my ranking in belts for martial arts. If I show up to the gym four or five times per week, I am going to get leaner and stronger. If I have the nutrition to back up my training in martial arts, I'm going to have the energy to perform, but also the right fuel in me to properly recover and get a good night's rest. I just loved that input, output, no nonsense relationship in fitness and health, in martial arts. And really, I mean, you could draw that parallel to business and life and absolutely anywhere. You always get you always get what you put into it. And that's what got me fascinated at such a at such an early age, being able to see the changes in my body, see the changes in my energy levels. And you know, I was lucky if some people can spend a lifetime trying to find something that's worthy of their absolute greatest effort and something that's worthy of their absolute greatest sacrifice. And I was fortunate enough to find that early. Some people search forever. I've found that with training and nutrition, I went all in. And in my teen years, I was reading articles and I just kind of been going nonstop ever since that point. And, and that nonstop nature has allowed me, not just you, but allowed me to struggle as to what my job description is. <laughs> when people are introducing me, they're like, hey, Dan, what do you do at like a social event? I'm like, I don't really know. <laughs> I do I do a lot of things at this point. I'm just an entrepreneur. But um, yeah, that's kind of how I got into it and how I fell in love with it over time. Yeah. So so I'm from Alberta, Alberta, Canada. And so yeah. um, you're from Ontario. Is that where you grew up or where did you grow up? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I grew up in Ontario. I spent my first 25 years here in Ontario. And then I moved out to Airdrie, which, as you know, is a, a city just north of Calgary. Yeah. And I stayed there for about four and a half years. And then I ended up moving back to London, Ontario to be with family, but absolutely loved and cherished my time out there. I built businesses while I was out there, had a lot of highs and lows, and you just can't replace the amount of beauty in nature that's in Alberta. There's nothing like that here in Ontario. And I absolutely love out West. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. I know when I, when you were speaking, um, you, you speak at different places. And I remember one time I, I think I sent you a message and I said, well, can you, can you come to Edmonton or something? And you're like, no, yeah. like I can't just like make a trip to Edmonton. I've got all these other speaking things yeah. that I'm doing, but I just remember I was like, oh yeah. So that's cool that you've been out here at least, at least, you know, kind of where we, so I would be North of there. Like I'm West of Edmonton. Just oh so yeah. I've been of, to Edmonton many times. Yeah. yeah so it's I, like, my, my my sister-in-law and her boyfriend actually had an apartment there. So I've oh, been there many okay. times. I love it. Cool. Yeah. Well, if you ever come yeah. back, you let me know and I'll go to any of your conferences and I'll hear you speak. Okay. <laughs> that sounds <laughs> love to, great. Love to do that. Okay. So what, one thing that's really intriguing about you, Dan, and there's a lot of things that are intriguing, um, but you left social media. And I remember yes. I was like, and I was following you on social media and all of a sudden I'm like, what happened to Dan? He's gone. So tell me like in hindsight, cause you've been, how long have you been gone from that? Like, was it six months ago or something? So I left it in February. Okay. I, I lasted January. That's I lasted one month in 2020 on social media and, and then I was out. So how has that been going? Like in hindsight, is that, is that like, have you, do you regret it? Was it good? Was it a good move? Because that was pretty bold of you. Like most entrepreneurs are not going to be leaving social media. They rely on social media. Right. Yeah. It's a, it is definitely a bold move, but that's kind of how I live, right? You, I, you don't, you go all in or you don't do it. That's, that's really, that's a philosophy of mine. I always live that way. And I think a lot of the, my actions have demonstrated that. And yeah, I've got no Twitter, no Instagram, no Facebook, no nothing. And it's not just like deactivation. No, the accounts are gone. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and in hindsight, it's one of the best decisions I've ever made. Um, uh, from, from a revenue perspective, my business revenue has never been higher. So it's an excellent way to debunk the myth that you have to be on social media in order to build a brand, build a name for yourself and build trust. Um, so I absolutely love that, that breaking through that myth. Um, it was an excellent idea because, it, it, social media in many ways, and it depends on the relationship that you have with it. It very much depends on the context of the individual and how they use social media as a tool. But for me personally, it was described in my brain as an entertaining distraction mm -hmm. because it was a distraction from the work that really mattered in my life, but it was dangerous because it was entertaining. So I would find myself just scrolling through, checking things that meant nothing to me. And then when you look at not just the accumulation of what happened in the day, that time you lost, but the, the week, the month, 
the years. What what more could you have done with the time on social media? Um, what, where could you put that energy? Because there's so much time and people are amazed. I love that phones have the app now. A lot of them are just built in. You can see how many hours you've spent on your phone per day. And they look at their phone. They're like, I've been on there for six hours. What? It's it, People are absolutely shocked at how much time they spend on there. And and I was one of these people. And I actually thought I had a good relationship with it. I would have specific time zones where I would post. But um, ultimately, it was an entertaining distraction. I felt that those distractions also took me away from the reason why I think I'm on this planet, which is to contribute to the health and fitness industry. And a contribution to an industry means you need to have an original thought. And when I'm on social media, the information can be fantastic. It's not bad information if you follow the right people. You can be up to date with certain sciences. You can be up to date with certain um, philosophies about how to coach properly. There's no doubt about that. If you follow the right people, it can be a good thing for you. But it... The the amount of distraction that social media brought to me was taking up a certain percentage of my brain away from creative thinking and that in moments now, I'm able to truly just think in silence rather than have my phone beckon me from my pocket, calling me, hey, you haven't checked notifications in a while. Hey, maybe you should refresh your feed. Hey, has that favorite person you follow posted yet today? Um, none of that stuff calls me anymore. So I've got more freedom in my mind for creative thinking. And creative thinking ultimately leads to original thinking. And original thinking leads to making a true contribution to the industry. And that's why I'm on this planet. I'm not here to be popular. I'm here to be a leader. That's what I'm trying to do. I could, I truly, to my core, I could care less what people think. I truly, truly don't care at all. So that's why I don't look for that external gratification and that uh, the like or the love or the comment or the subscribe or the share. Um, I'm not after that. I'm after true contribution. And, uh, and, and it's easier for me to say that as well, because you, you, in, you introduced me in the beginning of the podcast saying I work with a lot of high level people. Those high level people I, a lot of my business now is exclusively referral when it comes to coaching. You know, a professional athlete or a, a celebrity or a, a top business exec, they don't go online. It's very rare. They go, hey, that was a sweet Facebook post. Let me trust my $10 million athletic contract with that guy. It, that really doesn't happen. It's always a referral from their coach, a referral from their doctor, or a referral from their teammate. And I've got that referral network in place now. So in hindsight, it was one of the best things I've ever done because my business is actually doing better now. But more importantly, my brain is doing better. I feel more clear and less distracted on a day to daily basis. Yeah. So I'll ask you a question then. For somebody who's starting a business, though, um, would like, because I know you like when you quit social media, you were already well established. You're getting all your business from referrals, essentially. And uh, like for somebody who's starting, it, do you think they could still make a go of it or should they be on social media? Like, what would you say to? to like a beginner entrepreneur who's just getting started? It depends on what you want to get into because the, you have to follow your passion wherever that's going to lead you. So if you're somebody who just wants to work with general population and get them to a healthy body weight, that is something you can do locally. And a referral network can sustain your entire career that way. So it's not like a lot of people think that they need to get a million followers to be successful or have 100,000 followers or 100,000 subscribers. Look, if you have 500 loyal fans, you could be a multimillionaire and be successful just with 500 loyal people paying some sort of a subscription to you or renewing some sort of a coaching process actually telling their friends and referring out about you. You don't need nearly as many people as uh, a, what a lot of people think. They think they put arbitrary 100,000 followers, a million followers. I want 10 million followers. But um, as such a small number of people, you actually need to reach in order to be massively successful. But if you are um, starting in your business, I don't think that um, having a social media uh, account and providing free content is a bad thing at all. And in fact, I would recommend it if you're just beginning. But the reason why I recommend it is because 80% um, of marketing is who you're speaking to. And the way in which I use social media was to build content 
so that the people who I wanted to work with found me. And, and that's, I think, what I would recommend most for people just getting into it. Like, for example, hockeytraining.com is one of the successful businesses that I cooperate with one of my um, business partners. But when we make content, it's specifically to the hockey athlete. And that hockey athlete ultimately ends up finding us. So working with hockey athletes is something I'm incredibly passionate about. And when you're able to do that, you're able to carve out your niche and work with the people that you're most passionate about. And you're only ever going to be able to, to display your most character, charismatic and intellectual qualities about yourself when you're working with the population that you want to work with. That's the, you're going to be your most charismatic, your most intelligent, your most excited. You're going to be producing your highest level work working with the populations you want to work with. Because when you work with someone that doesn't interest you or get you excited or it's not someone you want to work with, you might be a little lazy with the program design, might be a little lazy with the meal plan design, probably don't want to create content for that type of population. So what I'm essentially getting at here is the small person just beginning. You w- a, Social media is a great way to speak exactly to your audience so that you can work with who you want to work with and ultimately be the best coach that you want to be. That's how I would use social media to carve out your clients rather than build a following, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. And I love how you talk, Dan, like everything you say is so like no nonsense. Like, yeah, like I listen to your Create Freedom podcast. I love it. Like it's just short and it's for business people. And then yes. I also listen to your, your, the Garner Report, your nutrition awesome. podcast. And so yeah. like, again, it's short, it's quick. And it's like something that's really tangible. Like I, you know, I can listen to it quick. I can get exactly what I want. And like, and you'll sometimes go on rants and you'll say like, why you don't like stuff. And, and I just, it's, yeah. you're entertaining to listen to, but you're also like really educated. Like, you know, you're stuff and I think that's what what really attracts people to you and that's certainly what like attracted me to you like when I found you I actually found you you were I think the first I can't even remember how I found you but I know like through Precision Nutrition it's a huge company that does nutrition certifications I got my my certification for nutrition through that and John Berardi has been a mentor for you and John Berardi is the founder of Precision Nutrition right so I think maybe that's kind of how I how I found you um Mm. but I loved how you will go into like all the science of nutrition, you'll figure it all out and then you'll spit it out for us so that we can understand it. It is clear. It's like the Coles note version. We don't have to go through all the journals and read everything ourselves. You've got the information Mm -hmm. and you're very science based and I love it. So I think we need to get into nutrition right now, Dan, because a lot of my listeners are going to want to know about that. I want to know about it. So one of the first questions I wanted to ask you is what questions do you get the most? So when people come to you, Dan, and they want to ask you about nutrition, say, what's one of the questions you get the most? would you say? Um, one of the questions I get the most, I mean, I think that any trainer gets the most is if you're at a social event, then uh, someone's just going to ask you how to lose weight or I've tried everything and fat loss isn't working. So I think that that would be in person. That's probably one of the number one questions that I get. Mm-hmm. But since being mentioned on the the Joe Rogan experience and uh, the success that I had with uh, Joe Rogan's best friend, Brian Callen, um, Brian Callen had been to six different doctors regarding his psoriasis. No one was able to help him. And I was able to put him into full remission. It never came back within two months by just doing his lab work, identifying some issues within his microbiome, and then eliminating the issues, getting him on a plan that he should be on. He's in full remission. It's never come back, even with him going back to a crappy diet sometimes on vacation and traveling and stuff like that. So I would say in person, fat loss is one of the big questions. But then um, online through emails, I would say working with autoimmune patients would be uh, a big one simply due to the Brian Callen, Joe Rogan, psoriasis type of thing. And then I would also definitely say athletic performance, because when people hear that I've worked with like um, Sean O'Malley or the the Super Bowl winners or any any of those people, they want to know like pre intra post workout nutrition. So probably those categories, fat loss, athletic performance, autoimmunity would be the top things, at least these days that gets thrown my way. Okay, so then let's go with that. (laughs) When it comes to weight loss, Dan, because there's a lot of people that come to me for weight loss. What would you say, what should somebody do if they want to lose weight? Maybe like what's your top three tips or however you want to take this, just take and roll with it. Sure. So if somebody wants to lose weight, they first have to understand that psychology is of equal importance to physiology. 
in that you need to be able to consciously have the awareness to understand that consistency beats intensity every single time. Um, one workout doesn't get you in shape. One week of training doesn't get you in shape. One week of dieting doesn't get you in shape. Biology responds to adaptations over time. And the over time is months and even years at a time. So whenever you take on a new nutrition plan or a new training plan in the hopes of losing weight, the very first thing you have to ask yourself is, hey, do I see myself following this diet plan six months from now or 12 months from now? If the answer is no, then it's not the diet plan for you. Because you're, you're going to do the exact same roller coaster that has led you to the point that you're going to try this new thing all over again. People lose a lot of weight and they, they tend to forget that if you don't incorporate sustainability into your plan, then you might as well have not lost the weight. And that's the kind of North America and Western society's problem is nobody has a weight loss problem. People lose millions of pounds every single year. But all of these people have a maintaining the weight loss problem. No one has a weight loss problem, but everybody has a maintaining the weight loss problem. And that's because they over respect uh, physiology and under respect psychology, because you can understand all of the metabolic steps involved in energy balance, creating energy, burning fat, creating the right workout. You can understand all of that, but if you can't maintain it, does it mean anything at all? Absolutely not. So that's where a coach comes into play. And that's what I would recommend most people who are interested in fat loss do, because you want a coach. Um, uh, a research study will never replace a coach. A macro calculator will never replace a coach. A, a blog post will never replace a coach. A coach is what's going to allow you, or at least a good coach, I should say, is going to focus on life transformation rather than body transformation. Because any moron can go in a 50% caloric deficit for four weeks and lose a ton of weight. But that will only get you a sweet before and after picture that you can post on social media. Awesome. But what's really ugly is the after after picture where you are right back to your before picture, or even worse within the next six months. And that's because you viewed your body as a project rather than viewing your body as a partner. Your body is the partner. It's the vehicle that has to, you have to stay within for the rest of your life. And if you're going to be involved with a partner for the rest of your life, you better build a damn good relationship with that partner, psychologically and emotionally. So things like the scale can't throw you off. Things like crash dieting should never be an option for you. Why would you crash diet your partner? You know that's going to have a rebound effect. Any action has an equal and opposite reaction. If you don't cheat for a month, then you're going to have a cheat fest for a whole week. And that's going to put you back to where you are. If you crash your metabolism for a month, well, then it will crash right back at you and make sure that even in a, in a calculated caloric deficit, you're not going to lose any more weight because you've destroyed your metabolism over the past month. This all comes back, not even to physiology, it comes back to psychology because you ultimately create the decision that, that manifests, manifests itself in the ripple effect in your physiology. That decision comes first. So working with a coach that's focused on life transformation, habit building, building a partnership with your body rather than making your body a project. But these all don't sound like fat loss, but they're the things that actually allow you to maintain the fat loss. I know you know how to lose weight. We can all not eat, but that never goes far, ever. So physiologically speaking, be conservative. We could, we could go real deep into this, right? Um, you want to you wanna only have a slight caloric deficit so that you can um, mitigate and stay away from things like metabolic dysregulation. Um, you want to have enough protein. You, want to have, uh, you don't want to eliminate any full macronutrient group. You don't want to say a no fat diet or a no carb diet or a no protein diet, whatever it is that you're doing. Um, you don't want to have any of these ideologies. The only ideology you should have is balance and consistency. And then when you have that in the forefront of your thinking, you're able to make the physical decisions easier. So if I know if I'm going to make a plan that I'm going to stick with for the next six to 12 months, then that 
forefront decision making is what's going to allow me to actually set the right caloric deficit, set the right macronutrients, set the right things here. So in in the world of fat loss, it depends how you want to where you want to take the conversation because we can talk physiologically, we can go, we can unpack that very well. But I think it's very important for the listeners to first know that you can't fit your diet plan. You have to make your diet plan fit you. That's the way it's got to be prioritized. If you do it the other way around, then it'll be unsustainable and you're going to be right back to, to where you started. Yeah, a lot of people, they say, oh, I just want a meal plan. I'm like, okay, well, is there anything on this meal plan that you even eat? Well, yeah. you know, I just want I just want more meal plans. And sometimes I think meal plans are a good place to start for a lot of people. But I, yeah, you know, I sure. agree with you. I think like people, and I've also had some of my clients, you know, mm -hmm. they want to come to me because I do like a 12 month type program, like typically longer type stuff. And they're like, well, yeah. I just, I just want to lose weight really quick. I'm just going to go and do this crash diet. I'm like, okay, but like, I'll still be here when you come back and you're back to square one. Right. So yeah. I love what you're saying. And I agree with everything that you're saying. Um, okay. So that's kind of fat loss. I want to talk a little bit about like the gut because sure. I know there's a lot of research on the gut. A lot of people have all kinds of issues that are often stemmed from the gut. So maybe they have some like, you know, mental problems. Maybe they have these auto autoimmune disorders. Maybe they have anxiety. Maybe they have depression and it's not always from the gut, but I think it often can be. Can you talk For a little sure. bit about the gut's role in some of those kind of problems that people face? Yeah, for sure. Um, the gut plays a massive role, I think, in the health of the entire body, because when you look at organ systems, you think of the adrenal glands, you think of um, the testes and the ovaries, you think of the thyroid, you think of the cardiovascular system, you think of a lot of these things, the brain. Um, but the only thing that feeds all of those organ systems are what you eat. And what you eat needs to be properly digested and assimilated. And if it's not, then it can manifest itself as issues within the other organ systems of the body. For example, if I have a digestion and assimilation issue, and, and we know from straight up metabolic research that we utilize iodine, zinc, and L-tyrosine to make thyroid hormone, well, then I may have a, a very low amount of thyroid hormone being produced, or I may have a very low conversion of inactive T4 to active T3. There may be issues with the thyroid, but how's the thyroid supposed to do its job if it's not being given the nutrients it needs in order to perform? It's a case where it's a supply and demand chain. If we don't have the raw material to make thyroid hormone, then don't blame the thyroid for not making thyroid hormone. Uh, we utilize um, vitamin B3 and fats to make sex hormones. We utilize um, uh, various amino acids. For example, L-tryptophan is important to, in the synthesis of both serotonin and melatonin, which is important for sleep length and sleep quality. We use um, L-tyrosine and phenylalanine to make epinephrine and nor epinephrine, which is our fight or flight neurotransmitters. We use, uh, again, phenylalanine and L-tyrosine to make dopamine, which is the neurotransmitter in our brain responsible for feelings of motivation, drive, and attention span. All of this stuff sounds really cool, but you aren't what you eat. You only are what you eat and actually absorb. So if any of that stuff doesn't get properly digested and assimilated, then it can't make its way to the other organ systems so that they can do their job appropriately. And that's where I think a lot of the industry has got like the brakes on right now because they think that, you know, it, it, it's the adrenal glands fault or you've got low testosterone. So that's the problem. They, they don't actually look behind what's the root cause of what's going on. And for example, if someone has low testosterone, you may go to the doctor and they'll give you a prescription for testosterone. Whereas the intelligent coach would say, okay, well, why was there low testosterone to begin with? Why don't we actually answer that question, solve it at the root causal level, because that's not normal functioning of the body. If you have a low value of something, it's because there's a problem happening. And something I always tell my students is the symptom is never the problem. The symptom is only ever the result of the problem. So in that example, someone could have low testosterone, but where's that coming from? Is it coming from inflammation? Is it coming from insulin resistance? Is it coming from a lack of fats in the diet? Is it coming from being overly stressed? Is it coming from a lack of sleep? Because uh, is it coming from zinc? Zinc is a literal rate limiting step in producing testosterone. If you don't have zinc, you don't make testosterone. These are all uh, logical and... Um, um, 
<laughs> well-known pathways to where someone can have low testosterone. But a lot of people just take that prescription and they'll bring their testosterone up. But if you haven't solved whatever issue was happening at the root causal level, and then you just hid the problem by injecting testosterone on a weekly basis, well, who knows now what damage that root cause is doing under the surface now, because you just threw a Band-Aid over it, you got rid of the symptom, but the symptom is nothing more than a cry for help. It's the, it's the body going, hey, we're not functioning optimally right now, so you've got an issue to deal with here. But if you just cover your eyes and put a Band-Aid on the issue by giving yourself a prescription, then uh, you're never going to get to that root cause. And that root cause will cause unknown damage under the surface um, until it becomes known. And lots of times at that point, a little too late. And you have to be reactive with your approach to health rather than preventative with your approach to health. And this all ties back into the gut because the gut feeds all of these different systems. And I really think it should be prioritized. And the same example that I just went through could have been used for the gut because a lot of people will, will take antacid pills because they get heartburn or acid reflux. Why was there heartburn or acid reflux to begin with? That's not normal. It's common but it's not normal. That's an important distinction. What's common is not normal. It's not normal for the cells to shoot acid up your esophagus. That's not normal. It's telling you something. Something's wrong. But then you have to also work with a coach who has a knowledge of gut health because the average coach is funny. You, they will scoff at someone who just gives a prescription due to a symptom, and yet they do the exact same thing with a supplement. They just kind of guess, here's an enzyme product, here's a probiotic product, you do this um, and just take that. Maybe it'll work itself out. But it's important to talk to someone who understands gut health at a deep level because that's the person who's going to be able to identify the root cause that's going to get rid of that problem and ultimately allow the body to function optimally in the absence of supplements or medication. And the reason why I, I say get a coach for something like gut health, because the, the idea of the gut is that it's not the gut. You can't just take a gut health protocol. You have uh, mastication. You have the, the chewing, the, 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 the enzymes involved in the saliva. Are you chewing your food enough? We have the esophagus. We have the stomach. We have the liver, the pancreas, the gallbladder, the ileum, the jejunum, the duodenum, the large intestine, the gut bacteria, the colon. We have what, what did I just say? Like 10 different organs. So we, we can't do just a gut protocol or we can't say, hey, take a probiotic or take an enzyme product um, because where in what tissue does the issue reside within and what are you taking in order to ensure you're having a root cause effect rather than a symptom based effect. And gut health is probably like, I don't know about you, but I got it. That's probably something I should have said in the top questions people ask me. Because how many people do you know that have bloating, gut distension, gut pain, loose stools, constipation? Um, how many people, how many clients have you worked with that have had that issue? Mm -hmm. Lots. <clears throat> A Lots. ton. And how come there's not more people like you, Dan? Like, how come there's not more people? Like, where do you, where do people find that? Like, it's so frustrating because I'll work with people you know, my clients and they're like, oh, the doctor just said I should take this or I should take that. Like, there's just, we don't seem to be like, nobody deals with the actual root of the problem. Like, mm -hmm. you know, what, why is that? Like, do you get frustrated uh, about that? Like when clients come to you and you've gotten like different prescriptions from doctors and stuff, like w what's your take on all that? Um, we well, have when, when no one else does it, it gives me a lot of work to do. Yeah, yeah. So that's <laughs> that's that's the good side of it. And so long as everyone else keeps screwing up, I'm going to have a lot of business. So <laughs> that's, uh, I, I'm, I'm joking. But um, in, in a reality sense, I don't really know. I'm not sure why more people don't think about that. Um, when I prescribe supplements, um, other than like the real basic ones, my supplements always have an end date because you should never need a supplement to, to, to do something that should be a normal function. You should never have to have a digest, digestion supplement. I mean, your, your, your stomach knows how to secrete enzymes and bile to break down um, protein, carbohydrates, and fats all by itself. It did it for many years until you started running into your problem. So I'm not sure why more people don't think that way, but it's important to have people who do think that way. And I think the, the main way to find out if your coach thinks that way is how comprehensive your assessment process is. 
um, your your questionnaires, your analysis, your assessment, if you do labs, um, whatever it is, you don't have to do labs, but the assessment process should be very comprehensive. Because if I just um, ask you for your name and weight, and then I make a plan for you, then I've got no idea who you are. I know who you are from the outside in. I have no idea who you are from the inside out. And the inside out results is what ultimately allows people to feel better, to get rid of their bad symptoms and become the best version of themselves. So I don't know why people don't take that approach, but I would say for the listeners that your coach should have a pretty heavy assessment process if you want to have good faith that they've got your back. Mm. Yeah. And you... Yeah. Like I love, I love what you do, Dan. Like I, every time I hear you talk, I'm just like, go, go. Yes. That's exactly what we need. We need that. <laughs> like I'm always about the root issue and not just in like nutrition and, and fitness and stuff, but the root issue of like even people's mental state, right? Like a lot of people, they're like, you know, they, they have these bad habits or they do these things and it's like, what's actually the root issue? Like, let's get to the root issue of everything. Like you yes. said, so we can become the best version of ourselves and we're not just sitting here in a rut, just spinning our wheels, trying to like take supplements and medications and stuff. I know what it's interesting. It, sometimes like there's so many people that I work with or like that maybe want to work with me, but they'll, they'll take, they'll spend like a thousand or a couple thousand dollars potentially on supplements, but they don't yeah. want to spend, you know, a few hundred dollars to learn actually like how to eat and how to exercise mm-hmm. so they can actually feel better. Right. And it's just, yeah. I think we just have such a supplement culture. We have such a band aid culture, right? Like, yes. Oh, just give them this, this pill or take this or do this protocol and then you're good. No, like we need to get to the root of the issue. And, and that's what I try to do, but I do have some limitations and I have had uh, some doctors tell me that I should actually really like get more certified and so that I can do lab analysis and that kind of stuff. I'm not sure if that's what I want at this point, but I feel like I should at least have somebody on my team that can do that one day. So, yeah. Yeah. All right. So what should we know about nutrition, Dan? What is some of the latest research maybe out there that you've kind of discovered that you're like, you know what, more people should know this. I know it's kind of a big question, but what would you say? Um, regarding what people should know, um, I don't know. I I would probably say nothing, to be honest. I know that sounds strange, but knowledge isn't power. Only applied knowledge is power. That's, that is what is true power. And I think the application is so much more important than the knowledge because we have a knowledge, a hungry nation right now that doesn't apply a thing that they learn that you could listen to a hundred podcasts, read a hundred articles, um, join a course. Um, you could do all, I'll, I'll break this down in, a, in an easy example. So let's compare, um, a physician and let's compare a teenage, uh, young man from California. Okay. The physician, let's say he's overweight. And I've seen many overweight physicians in my day. It's nothing against them. I'm not painting a broad brush. I'm just saying, and they will have uh, all the knowledge about physiology and anatomy and pharmacology um, that anybody would ever need in order to be healthy. They know way more than they need to know in order to be healthy. And yet he's not, he's missing the application. But then we've got our young man from California here, say 14 years old. He wakes up and his mom makes him eggs for breakfast and his mom packs his lunch that he brings to school. So he's got a healthy breakfast made by mom, healthy lunch um, made by mom as well. And then after school, maybe he's a part of the soccer team. Maybe he's a part of a hockey team. Maybe he's a part, or let's just say he's a surfer. That's very California. Let's say after school, he goes surfing. And then he goes home at the end of the night, another family meal, probably meat, starch, and vegetable for dinner, sitting down with the family, ends up crashing, going to sleep, and doing it all over again. So we've got our physician who is overweight despite knowing everything they need to know about being healthy. And then we've got our teenage kid who knows absolutely nothing about the physiology, anatomy, or pharmacology in being involved in health, and yet has three square meals every single day. He's surfing, so he's exposed to plenty of sunlight. He sleeps eight hours per night. He's physically active surfing every single day. We've got someone who's doing everything correctly without an ounce of knowledge behind it. So when you ask me, what should people know? I would say stop knowing and start doing. That's what you need to do because 
only knowledge isn't power. Only applied knowledge is power. And doing is so much more important than knowing. Stop overcomplicating the process. You want to understand how 0.001 grams of leucine impacts the cytochrome 4 50 enzyme within the liver and ensure if that matches up with your genetic variant at a full moon or not. But people are so focused on the details and I call it majoring in the minors. Mm -hmm. Why are you focusing so hard on the crap that doesn't matter? Just go out there and do the things you already know that are going to make you healthy. That's what you should be spending your time on. Nice. Yeah, I agree. Totally agree. Just start applying what you already know, guys, and you'll be yeah. fine. You'll be totally fine. Yeah. Good. Yeah, in a way that you can remain consistent with. Yes. So yeah. I had a question here for you, and I don't think you need to answer it. I think I can answer it based on what you said. My question was, what is the best diet, Dan? And I think you would say the best diet is one that you can stick to, right, that you can maintain long term, and one that's not yes. cutting out any major macronutrient. Am I right? Yeah, that's absolutely right. The best diet is always the one that you can follow. You know, I've had people come to me before, and I'm sure you have as well, where they will have lost weight on a diet, but then they regained it all back. Same old story we've seen many times. And they'll say something like, well, the diet was great. I just couldn't stick with it. And then I want to shake their head and be like, well, the diet wasn't great then, was it? You couldn't stick to it. So it wasn't good. They've got a, a self Uh, a self-blame, a self-hatred. They killed their own confidence, yet it was the diet's problem. It had nothing to do with them. They were motivated for change. They just chose the wrong vehicle for change. Mm -hmm. So the best diet doesn't exist. Stop looking and start applying. Work on what you can consistently stay to, and that's ultimately what's going to get you to your goals. Yeah. So what would you say, like I have a lot of people coming to me, you probably do too, What do you say about the keto diet, Carla? What do you say about the keto diet? I've tried the keto. What should I try the keto? What would you Mm. say about that, Dan? Um, I would say that the, when it comes to the keto diet, I would say that, uh, it's, it's, there's nothing wrong with it, but I would say that a lot of the people who, who advocate it are misinformed about how it works and misinformed about its long-term sustainability. Because when it, when it comes to, looking at something that's going to be sustainable, you don't even really have to look just at yourself, but you should be looking at someone's culture, at someone's family, and at someone's uh, best friends and or their spouse. Because just because you could be on a zero carb diet forever, your family meals aren't going to be that way. You're hanging out with your friends isn't going to be that way. Lots of times your spouse isn't going to be on board with something like that. I think that, and, and even yourself, you may use it to prepare for, for vacations or prepare for something like that. But um, in the long term, do you really ever see yourself not having um, rice ever again, not having pasta ever again, not having pastries ever again, not having desserts ever again, not having oatmeal ever again, not having so uh, quinoa. There's so many good, healthy things. And when you realize that energy balance regulates body weight and that carbohydrates don't make you fat, it just simply doesn't make sense to me that I would eliminate an entire macronutrient from my diet because now I'm, I'm eliminating um, antioxidants, phytonutrients, vitamins, and minerals from an entire group of food that I, I otherwise wouldn't have to eliminate and still reach my goals in a way more sustainable way. If you can honestly say, I'm not going to eat carbs for the rest of my life, well, then maybe it is the plan for you for sure. But I, when I said two things, misinformed about sustainability and misinformed about how it works, um, it doesn't work. The keto diet doesn't work because carbs make you fat. It's, it's absolute nonsense. Uh, we've known for five plus decades of very well controlled literature at this point in metabolic wards, absolute gold standard. It's basically like having human rats, putting people inside of a lab, measuring their exact energy input and output and seeing what happens. What do we find? Well, in five plus decades of controlled research, never once has the calories in versus calories out equation been debunked. Never. It's one of the few things we actually know in nutrition. It takes a lot to say that you know something. 
Like when you look in the fields of chemistry and physics, they've got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years of theory and testing and applying and testing and reapplying and re-theorizing. And they say they've got like what, like three laws? Like there's very few things that you can truly say that you know. And nutrition is such a, a, a science that's still in its infancy. It's in, in terms of science and years and centuries, nutrition is nothing compared to physics. Nutrition is nothing compared to chemistry. It's nothing uh, compared to a lot of things. So there's only a few things we actually know. And one of the things we know is that energy balance regulates body weight. The way in which the keto diet works is simply because it eliminates what most people overeat on which is carbohydrates. But um, if you have a poor relationship with carbohydrates and you do overeat on them, is the real answer to completely eliminate them? You think that's going to have a rebound effect in the long term? I think it would be much more advantageous for you to have a more balanced plan that has a balanced um, way of uh, bringing in nutrition, vitamins, minerals, macronutrients into your plan in a way in which in a way in which that you have a healthy relationship with. Because cutting something off never works in the nutrition world, and we learn that the hard way by going zero carb or going zero fat or going on a crash diet, or completely eliminating something from your life. It always comes back and has a way in which of sabotaging the future. Um, and I would caution people to have pattern recognition based on the past. If you've done the keto diet and you think it's worked for you in the past, why are you still going back to it all the time? Because it really didn't ultimately work. So I think that the keto, I don't want to paint a bad brush on it because there is some decent literature on its uh, anti-inflammatory um, effects. It has excellence uh, within the department of bringing insulin sensitivity to someone who is otherwise insulin resistant. Um, uh, if, if you do produce ketones, you're truly in a ketogenic state. You can uh, produce uh, beta hydroxybutrate, which has been known to have some neuroprotective effects on our brain as well. So there is a few good things in there. But so few people can sustain it for the long term that I almost never use it in my practice unless I have a medical reason to do so. Because if I can lose weight while eating carbs, and since carbs are going to be a part of my life and I want to build consistency and sustainability into my life, why would I choose a plan that I know I'm not going to remain um, consistent with? It just kind of, from a scientific perspective, you can still lose weight, be lean, and be extraordinarily healthy without it. But then just from a common sense perspective, I know that if me and my wife want to go to an Italian restaurant this Saturday, that I'm going to get pasta. So I've got to find a way to work that into my life and work with the partner that is my body that's ultimately just going to allow this thing to be long term. And I think on that note, if I was on the keto diet, and then it was my wife's and I's anniversary and we wanted to go to an Italian restaurant, like, man, would, would I really give myself like guilt? Would I have guilt about celebrating my anniversary? I'd have guilt about doing something that's going to make my wife happy. Would I have, um, you know, like a, like a self doubt or a self sabotaging behavior about that situation that should have been celebrated, that should have been happy. I think that, um, when it comes to nutrition, at least for me and the way in which I like to coach, nutrition should always be additive. It should always be something that adds energy to your life, adds vitality, um, adds to your confidence. And the moment when nutrition adds stress or anxiety or self-doubt um, or self-sabotage, that's the antithesis of good nutrition. Good nutrition is always additive. It should never take away psychologically or physically. So that's kind of, I guess, my take on it in long story short is that I don't use it as much because physiologically, everybody can reach their goals without it. And psychologically, at least the people I've met and worked with can't sustain it for any longer than six months usually at the most. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. I had another question for you. I know you're quite an advocate of, of eating protein, and um, and so am I. But some people would say, yeah, but too much protein, Dan. You know, you're gonna wreck your liver. You know, you're, you you just you need to be 
being a little more careful. What would you say, like when you talk about macronutrient nutrient ratio, like what's sort of a good balance? Like some people say, okay, 40% carbs, 30% protein, 30% fat. I know it depends on the person. And that's another thing that you always say, it depends. And that drives some yeah, people yeah. crazy because I say that all the time too. Well, it depends yeah. what you're after. Well, just tell me what to do. I can't just yeah. tell you what to do because I don't know what you need. I don't know your goals. I don't know your history. Um, but what would you say about protein, Dan? How much protein should we eat? Um, protein, it's on a spectrum. Um, pretty much everybody is going to do perfectly fine with 0.8 to 1.2 grams per pound of body weight per day. That is going to be an excellent total daily intake and protein timing. The best protein timing strategy you could ever have is to have simply an even distribution throughout the day. So if my total allotment, if I did one gram of protein per pound of body weight a day and I was 200 pounds, when I wanted to split that up across five meals, well, then I would have 40 grams of protein in each meal. That is the best protein timing strategy you could ever do is simply just even distribution. And there's a large area of science behind why I say that. But for total daily intake, 0.8 to 1.2, I'll actually go lower if you're on a mass gaining phase, despite popular belief. A lot of people think you need more protein if you're gaining mass. But the reality of the situation is you actually can get away with a little bit less. And if you are leaning down, that's when you actually need a little bit more in order to preserve your lean muscle mass while in a caloric deficit. So I'm a little bit more prone to leaning towards 1.2 when an athlete is getting lean and a little bit more prone to going 0.8 to 1 if an athlete is massing up. But if somebody struggles with cravings, then I'll go up to 1.5 grams of protein per pound of body weight a day um, for purely psychological reasons, because we know protein is the number one most satiating nutrient in the nutrition world. Meaning if you add protein to a meal, it helps you feel fuller longer. So if somebody is really struggling with cravings and they're very hungry on their current plan, then you can bump up the protein and allow the body to naturally feel fuller longer. So that's kind of how I structure protein intake. And uh, the second kind of side question that you asked there was what kind of breakdown would you use? Um, setting protein is of utmost importance. It needs to be set um, per pound of body weight or per kilo, whatever you're working with. And then I like to set fats on a percentage basis because that's where the majority of the research is, is based on a percentage of dietary intake rather than based on per pound of body weight. And for males, I'll typically have males around 25% of fat intake per day, whereas females, I'm a little bit more prone to going 30 to 40% per day. And then carbs simply just make up the rest. So let's say you had a male, um, one gram of protein per pound of body weight per day because they're massing up. Boom, good. And then 25% of that caloric intake is going to go towards healthy fats. All right, now we've got our fat intake and we have our protein intake. So then whatever is left in your caloric allotment simply comes in the form of carbs. And that's like kind of 101, how you would set up the base, base plan. Now, nutrient timing and working with cravings, working with psychology, working with their schedule, things can change a lot there. And that's where the it depends comes into play. And that's where we got to filter what we say based on who we're working with. Um, you essentially have to filter the content through the context of who you're working with. Filter the content knowledge you know through the context of the person that's sitting right in front of you. And that's why you can't replace a coach because a coach is able to do that filtration process and find a way to make the content match the context for consistency. Yeah, I love that. I love that you said that. Yeah, that's great. So we do need a lot of protein because, yeah, sometimes... But, but I, what I do often, Dan, is when people come to me and they're not eating a lot of protein, I'm not just going to suddenly... Like if they're having, you know, maybe they have you know, 10% protein in their diet. I'm not going to suddenly mm. jack them up to 30% because they yeah. might get constipation, right? So I, I find that I'll typically just like slowly kind of go by increments. Is that what you would do too, what you would recommend? It depends who I'm working with. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to give you that answer. Okay. Um, because if you're a UFC fighter and you've got to fight in eight weeks, I don't care. You do what I say. Um, right. Cause we've got a short timeline and honestly, that's the context of the situation. The athlete's not hiring me to take it easy on him. Why? 
because someone's going to try and kick his face off inside of a cage in eight weeks. It's pretty easy to be motivated to stick to a plan if you might lose teeth if you don't. Um, So that's the context of that situation. But if I'm working with someone who's very new to nutrition, is a little bit resistant to change, not that motivated right now, then yeah, the increment strategy would be way more effective for them in the long term. Right. Okay, cool. Mm. And what's the best way? I mean, you talked about it a little bit, but I just want to talk a little bit about fitness here. What's the best way for somebody to get strong? Like they want to To bulk up. They want to get some mass. What's the best way, fitness and nutrition-wise? What would you say? Um, They want to bulk up. They want to mass up. So I think that whenever you are talking about bulking up, you first have to consider calories once again. And like I kind of alluded to earlier, you want to be – Uh, modest, I should say, with either the deficit or the surplus that you introduce into someone. There's always this, there's a state of of maintenance. And for the purpose of the audience, a state of maintenance is when calories in equal calories out. So the amount you're taking in in the form of food and drink every day equals the amount you're expending on a day-to-day basis from your basal metabolic rate and all of your physical energy expenditure. That is a state of maintenance when your body weight is not moving. But if you want to either lose weight or go up in weight, you need to be very modest. I'm I'm a fan of introducing only 5 to 10% um, deficits or surpluses. And in the the context of the surplus, how to bulk up and build mass, um, you want to be modest with it uh, because you don't want to run into metabolic dysregulation. If you, if you have too high of a deficit, you run into metabolic adaptation where your metabolism decreases itself. But if you go too high in a surplus, then you end up in metabolic dysregulation. And when you run into metabolic dysregulation, what do I mean by that? Well, that's induced by simply being at too high of a body fat percentage. The days of having old school bulking routines are long gone. If you should be trying to gain muscle, you shouldn't be trying to gain weight. There, there's a huge difference between those two things. Because if you start adding up too much fat, well, one thing we know about fat is the higher your percentage of body fat is, the higher amount of estrogen you're going to have circulating within the body. And estrogen is not going to play a big role in you building a lot of muscle mass and strength over the course of us coaching together. So we want to avoid that quite a bit. We don't want to eliminate estrogen at all. It's very important for optimal health, but it's also not something you want to prioritize if you want to build muscle and strength. So we keep we keep um, estrogen regulated by staying lean, but most importantly, we also keep insulin sensitivity regulated by staying lean. And the, the long story short on insulin sensitivity is when you're lean, essentially the nutrients that you're coming in have a way greater disposition of being utilized within the muscle cell rather than the fat cell. But if you are too, if you're a little bit too overweight, then you end up running into a situation where you are insulin resistant. And that's a scenario where your nutrients that you're coming into the body are a lot more likely to be dispositioned into your fat cells rather than your lean muscle tissue. So staying lean optimizes your hormonal environment via your testosterone to estrogen ratio for optimal strength and muscle gain. But it also uh, optimizes your nutrient partitioning in that you're putting the nutrients where you actually want them to go into the muscle cell rather than to the fat cell. And what does this mean for people? Well, there's a huge physiological reasoning behind what I'm saying. I'm really simplifying it right now. But men simply don't go over 15% body fat. And women should ideally not go over about 25 to 26% body fat. That's really, if, if you truly want to be fully optimized from a hormonal and um, insulin resistance sensitivity relationship perspective, those are your, your, your turnarounds. So if I was working with a male and he came to me and he was at 16% body fat and he wanted to mass up, I'd say no. I'd say we're going to lean down first, we're going to optimize your internal environment, and then we're going to mass up. Why? Because it's not the calories you're taking in that matters. It's the physiology that those calories are going into that's going to dictate the adaptation from that food. If you dump a lot of calories into an insulin-resistant, estrogen-dominant male, it's not going to turn into muscle mass. Simply not. But if you dump a lot of calories into a high-testosterone, insulin-sensitive male, 
you're going to be at a much greater metabolic advantage of optimizing the perfect environment that facilitates muscle gain and strength development. So that would be the big thing from a caloric perspective. Um, but then from a training perspective, you need to be on a logically progressive plan as well. And when it comes to actually building muscle mass, we know there's three primary mechanisms that build mass. Number one is mechanical tension. Number two is metabolic stress. And number three is muscle soreness. Those three pathways all do different things within our internal environment to optimize muscle mass and strength development. Uh, mechanical tension, for people who aren't familiar, mechanical tension comes from the little bit more heavy lifting. It's actually when a muscle is stretched under resistance. So like a full range of motion bench press, really stretching my chest, that would create uh, what's known as mechanotransduction. And that stretch actually results in a chemical reaction. So even though the muscle is just stretching, there is a chemical response and reaction that ends up creating something known as mTOR. And mTOR, you can think about it as just a cellular signaling mechanism that the brain uses to tell the body, hey, we're under a lot of resistance right now in a stretched position. So we need to build muscle mass and strength so that we can deal with that stress a lot better next time. That would be one pathway for muscle growth from training. Your metabolic stress pathway is uh, simply getting the pump. When you have uh, your muscles are burning, you've got your veins are popping, you feel pumped up, that's metabolic stress. And that's when blood is filling up the muscle and creating a lot of anabolic effects through, again, a lot of different cellular signaling pathways there that we can get into if you want. Um, there, but very simply, get a pump. And that'll optimize metabolic stress. And last but not least, delayed onset muscle soreness. That does signal um, muscle growth as well. And it's been demonstrated to actually increase recruitment of what's known as satellite cell muscle fibers. There are muscle fibers that exist in the body. And then when muscle damage is done to the muscle fiber, then those cells are recruited to repair that muscle and then therefore build it up because they're added to the additional protein in the body. You're creating protein synthesis, which is muscle growth within that body. So again, it can, it can be very, very overcomplicated, but you can also just do a 10% caloric surplus, have one gram of protein per pound of body weight per day, and then have a real professional design your plan. And the plan should include mechanical tension, metabolic stress, and some muscle soreness effect from your workouts. If you truly want to start checking all the boxes for making the most amount of results in the least amount of time. Man, you're so smart. How did you get so smart, man? Just, you're just, <laughs> and you're so articulate, right? Because a lot of times people will talk about nutrition, they'll talk about fitness, and they're using so many, you know, these big words, and it, like nobody understands, but you're so articulate. Mm. You just get that out. So that's a real gift of yours that I've noticed. And I think that's why I listen to you so much and read your stuff, because I'm just like, this guy, like, not only are you super smart and super educated, but you know how to get it out so that the average person can understand it. It's not way over everybody's head. So thank you for thank doing you. that. I know this will be like super valuable to like everybody that's listening, but I want to talk about a little bit, not a lot more about business because you know, I don't want to go there too much. Although I would love to talk to you about fitness, nutrition, business all day, all day. I could sit yeah. here and talk to you and pick your brain. So, uh, yeah. So I love that you're doing this, but how did you get so successful Dan? I know you've got like a bunch of different businesses. Maybe you can just, you know, you've got hockey, hockey training, you've got podcasts, you've got your nutrition mentorships, you've got your fitness mentorships, and then you have like a, a whole kind of business coaching thing that you do as well. Like, yeah. Tell us a little bit about that. How did you get there? And like, how come you're so successful? What is it about you? What have you done to be so successful in your life? Well, I appreciate you saying that. Thank you so much. Um, I think that first, first, I think that it's important to not take too much credit for your success. Like, um, I, I, I won the lottery, right? Not literally, but um, I was born with health. I was born with excellent parents. I was born in a free country. I was born, you know, I, there's so many, I feel like in a lot of ways I was born on third base and then it's up to me to run home. I still got a score, but I was born on third base and then I'm able to just sprint 
to a home run. Whereas a lot of other people, they may not even be up to bat yet. They might still be on the bench. They may be on first base because they weren't born in a free country. Maybe they had, um, they were unlucky with their parenting. They got unlucky with being born in a bad part of the city. Um, I didn't have any of that. So I think that if, if you've got self-awareness, um, there's no real such thing as self-made. There's so many people that play a role in success and it's your parents, your teachers, your mentors. Um, and even if some of these people do bad things, they still play a role in your success because they motivate you to get to that next level. <laughs> so having the awareness to not take all the credit for the things that you've done, I think that that's criti- very important. But in respect to, um, to what I do personally, uh, Miyamoto Musashi, he wrote, he's a samurai and he wrote a book thousands of years ago and it's, it's still in print it's called the book of five rings it's fantastic and one of his lines that he said was when you see the way broadly you can see it in all things and that's how i've been able to i think branch off into different categories right i've got the the education business the coaching business um hockeytraining.com createfreedom.com the speaking events um i have a real estate investment company now as well there's a lot of things that i do but when you see the way broadly you can see it in all things and what he means by that is that if you're able to become a master in one thing then you know what it takes to become a master in something else and I think that, you know, my, we talked about it at the beginning of the podcast, that input output relationship, you know, what you need to put into something in order to get exactly what you want out of it. And when it comes to being successful, it's so much more about the characteristic qualities that you bring to the table, rather than the recipes for success that you bring to the table. Um, everybody out there looking for business coaching, trying to do be an overnight success, they've got it backwards a little bit, um, or just completely wrong, not even backwards, because they're looking for a recipe of success rather than at qualities of character. Because when you have discipline, when you have self-awareness, when you have delayed gratification, when you have positivity, when you have um, these characteristic qualities, those are the things that are going to allow you to become a black belt in jiu-jitsu, to build a business coaching business, to build a hockey training business, to build a real estate investment business. It's not a recipe I'm following. It's a reflection of my character. And when you see the way broadly, you can see it in all things. And I think that understanding that is what's allowed me to kind of do things that have seemingly no relationship with one another, but I was still able to effectively do them without a master's degree, without a PhD, without any of that stuff, because that I think is the recipe of success is the qualities of character that you bring to the table. So I think that that simply would, would be my answer to that. I love that you said that. That's awesome. Yeah. And I think it's like, and that's, I think that's really what, what keeps me going and listening to you is because you have that character, like it comes through. And you said something in your Create Freedom podcast the other day. And I was like, I love that so much. And what you said was, you said you should pay your staff more. And and everybody's yeah. always telling me, Carla, you got to save money. You know, you got to go get these VAs and pay them $5 an hour. You know, you got to save, save, save. I'm like, no, no, I got to spend. I got to spend yes. and I got to reward my, I mean, my staff are going to love hearing this, but you know, like I want yeah. them to have a raise. I want them, like, I want to reward their hard work. Right. And I don't want their wage to be stagnant. I don't want mm. them to feel like they're not like, I'm always like, you know, is it fair? And I want to give them a raise as they start producing better. Like they, they should be rewarded for that. Right. So I want to pay my staff really good. That's really important to me. And I want like, yeah, that's really important to me. So when you said that, I was just like, that just shows your character too, right? That you're like, you're looking out for other people. You're not just like, how can I, you know, make as much money as possible and who cares who I step on type of attitude, right? Exactly. Yeah. And the the best investment you could ever make is in your own business. The best investment you could ever make is in yourself. The, the, if you're putting more money in your idea, rather than if you put money into an investment portfolio that maybe will get 8%. Like, I think it makes so much more money to put your investment in the one vehicle you have control over rather than in a, in a retirement plan that you have no control over that has less 
return on investment. So mm. pay, paying the staff more is going to make them love you. And when they love you, they work hard. Right. Yeah. And I mean, mm. I, I got a counselor recently and I, I've had a business coach now for three years. Um, nice. And just like, yeah, and I want to pay my staff more and I want to train them more. And like, and I just, yeah, like, I love that. I love that about you, like your message. I love everything that you do, Dan, with, with all your businesses. And I just, I can see why you're so successful. And I want to keep following you because I know you've helped me already so much just by, but like, I just want to be around you, right? Like, I'm just like, oh, this guy's successful. He's got so many cool yeah. ideas. Like, it'd just be cool to like spend more time, go to your conferences and that kind of thing. So I'm going to keep listening to you. I'm going to keep following you. I'm going to keep watching your stuff. Um, and I hope the listeners will too. So where's the best place for them to, to check out your stuff, Dan? Yeah. So like, as, as they know, I've got absolutely no social media these days. So uh, I did that so that I could provide a world-class online coaching experience um, with no distractions. So if anybody wants to work with me directly, um, I typically work with higher level people who are interested in lab-based nutrition. So really identifying in an objective way where the root cause issue is, eliminating that root cause issue and allowing you to live your life the way that you want. So if you're interested in that high level training and nutrition process, then go to coachgarner.com and scroll down to the bottom. I've got a contact me area there. Um, that's the only way you can get in contact with me these days because of the no social media. So that's at coachgarner.com. Scroll to the bottom of the contact form. If you're interested in the, the principles that I use in order to build the various businesses that I've built and you want to learn from somebody who has done the online game successfully and created real freedom for himself, then check out create freedom.com. That's where I do all of that type of work. And uh, check out the Garner Report on iTunes. It's a podcast that I have. The Create Freedom podcast is out there as well. But if you just go to coachgarner.com and createfreedom.com, you'll, you'll be able to find me. Awesome. Yeah. And his podcasts are really good. You guys, I've been listening to them for years and I love every one of them. They're short, they're quick, they're to the point. And they're, yeah, just like you, you know, you're just like, you're to the point, you're getting it done. And uh, yeah. So thank you. It's been such an honor, Dan, to have you on here. Seriously, this is just like a dream of mine to be able to actually like mm. interview and ask you questions. So really appreciate you taking the time today. Thank you so much for having me on here, Carla. I absolutely love talking shop and I'd be happy to do it again. Oh, awesome. Good. Thank you. This episode is brought to you by my company, Power Fitness Online. We are a tight knit fitness community and we guide you every step of the way to get fit and stay fit through our live workouts, nutrition coaching, and incredible support team. Go to powerfitnessedson.com to learn more. Thank you for tuning into the podcast today. If you enjoyed it, please leave a positive review on Spotify, Stitcher, Apple Music, or wherever you're listening. And if you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, I would love to see your comments. I would love to know what you think about this episode and uh, interact with you. I love hearing from you. Once again, I'm Carla Rand, and this is The Carla Rand Show. And I can't wait to see you next week for our next episode.